morning, everybody, and welcome to this episode of 30 Minutes to President's Club. My name is Armand Farouk, and I'm here with my co-host, Nick Sigelski. And today, it is the man who's a phone machine, Matthew Mazinkowski. He is the VP of Sales over at Boomerang, a.k.a. Baden. Nick, why should people listen? Well, the magic device called the phone is still one of the best ways to get meetings on the books. But it's not just about getting meetings on the books. It's actually making sure your prospect shows up. And so if you're looking for a great episode on how to call to get intel so that you don't spend hours doing research, if you want to learn how to act like a confused man to get meetings booked, if you want to learn how to make sure your prospects show up to your book meetings, this is one to listen to. All right, Matthew, welcome to the show. We start every single episode with your top three actionable takeaways. So let's get your three. Awesome. Yeah. Action number one is what's called the confused old man call opener. It's my favorite cold calling style penned by Jeremy Miner. So what you do is you imagine that you're lost as an old person, potentially looking for a bathroom at a mall. And you're using your tonality, verbal pauses, and specific words to act confused so that you can get the person on the other line to open up and ideally want to help you. So when is this a good time to use? I particularly like it for gatekeepers, but it also works for inbound and cold and many other situations as well. So an example of how to use this with a gatekeeper would be, hey, this is Fran. Uh, Hi, Fran. It's just Matthew Mazinkowski. I'm wondering if you could possibly help me out for a moment. Pause right there. They'll respond, uh, yeah, sure, what's this about? I'm not sure if you're the right person I should be calling. I'm looking for the person who might be responsible for the systems and the teams that, uh, that teams would use for follow-ups and possibly meetings. And then you would continue that conversation. Hopefully, Fran would give you some information on who to get to and maybe even connect you with that person right there. Very nice. What's number two? Number two is what I call book it before you book it. Now, this one seems pretty obvious, but I've seen even the most seasons reps. It's where they get off a call. You're excited. We had a great prospect meeting, but you forget to book the next meeting before you get off. And so the process that I employ is is four steps. Uh, First, you set expectations at the beginning walk through how this is going to be a multi-meeting approach or a multi-step approach. And then number two is end the meeting five to seven minutes early, the meat of it, so that you have some time to plan and prepare and schedule in that next meeting before the prospect hops off the call. And then three is to make sure during the meeting, you have a good reason for the next meeting. And the fourth step is to ask for that next meeting, making sure that you loop in all the other stakeholders to that call. So what I would do, how I might say this at the end of a discovery would be, John, based on what you shared with me today, it looks like there's a good chance that Boomerang can help your team hit your goals of getting more meetings. So our next step is to show you how that your reps can make that happen with a tool. I have some time tomorrow or Friday to demonstrate this. What would work better for you, John and Sandy? Beautiful. Round us out, Matthew. What's number three? And number three is the either or close. This one is my favorite close by far. It's because people love options. It makes decisions easier. And we also love to own our own choices as well. So what the either or close does is it gives your prospect two options often to work with to make a decision. You narrow it down and you let them choose. So this empowers them to own it and make it. So what I might use for a cold call would be, so John, thanks for the meeting today. Looking at the calendar, it looks like I have some time later today or possibly even tomorrow. What would work better for your schedule? Or for a close, I might say, so from what we covered today, I get the sense that you see Boomerang helping you solve this follow-up and meeting scheduling challenges that you're facing. And have you given more thought on what you're planning to lean towards, the premium or the pro option? So those are two examples that you might use In either situation, you work it forward and get that meeting on the calendar. So Matthew, let's go back to this hilariously named old man cold call opener. You ask someone, I'm curious if you can help me out. Who's the person who manages this, this, or this? I imagine there are two potential answers they could give you. The first answer would be, it's John, the VP of sales. The second answer they would give you is, whoa, like what's this regarding? Or what company are you calling from? Let's go with the first example. So let's assume they say, oh, it's John, the VP of sales. What do you do from there? Yeah, from there, I would say, oh, Fran, that's great news. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. Would we be able to get connected somehow? Something like that. And try to ask and, and, and ask her to connect me with the VP of sales. And at that point, I imagine they're going to be like, what's this regarding? What do you say? Yep, yep. And so then I would, again, I for me, it's like still confused here at this point when I'm talking to Fran. Obviously, when I get in with with John or Joe or whoever the VP of sales is, we're going to be 
pretty straightforward to the point. But with Fran specifically, I'm like, it's about potential systems and processes that you guys are using right now that maybe there's some hidden gaps and was just curious, wanted to find out if there was a possible way that we could help you on some of these potential hidden gaps, something to that effect. Talk to me about what you're doing with your tonality here. You're including a lot of filler words. You're making yourself seem unsure. Explain to me Mm -hmm. the philosophy behind why you're doing that. Yeah, I think that's my favorite part about this. And I think that's something that can be taken to any of the cold calling openers, Nick, because you know, I listened to one of your podcasts recently where you were share the name or heard the name approach. I love that approach. So great. But you can even employ a little bit of the tonality and confusion here that I'm describing here in those openers as well, even the permission-based opener as well. But what I'm doing with my tonality is I'm trying to, again, come across as someone who's lost someone who doesn't really know. I'm like knocking on the door of this business and I'm saying like, what, where do I go? I like, I'm trying to find this person. And so I'm trying to employ confusion to be able to get the person I'm looking to talk to and get past the person who is the gatekeeper who might prevent me from getting to the right person. Yeah. I'll tell you where I'm thinking about how I would use this is I used to sell to law firms. And usually the decision makers at law firms are the partners at the firm who are on the executive committee. And believe it or not, a law firm that even has like 500 partners won't always publish who's on the executive committee. And that often changes. It might refresh year over year and they do voting. And so for me, I had the option of either calling all 500 partners to try to figure out who was there or... I would cold call the firm and the front desk just to ask who was on the executive committee. And then I would call those people and ask for them at a later date to get through and put through. But if I would call the law firm and just be like, yo, who's on your executive committee? They'd be like, whoa, 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 who, what's this regarding? It's a law firm. They sometimes be a little bit cloistered with that. But if I had taken the confused old man approach it would actually be a bit easier for them to be like, oh, it's this person and this person. And then I don't even need to ask to be put through. I can call back at a later date and be like, hey, could you get me over to Armand Farouk, please? And now I get put through to the partner who is on the EC. Armand, I know you do some stuff with like groaning when you make cold calls. And I think that's a sort of similar philosophy. I groan because I'm in pain when I'm making cold calls. But what Matthew is actually referencing is what's called the heard the name tossed around opener. And what you do is you essentially, before you introduce yourself, you explain how you work with other people like them, because you want that to be the first thing that they hear. And if I say it super stiff, it's going to come off as really, really canned and telemarketery. So I say it like this. I say, hey, Matt, we work with a few... uh, and recent portfolio companies, it's Armand at Pave. Have you heard her name tossed around? And I'm calling you and I'm sort of like, hey, like you, you, you've heard of us before, right? As if I was calling a friend. But if I opened up and I said, Matthew, we work with a few Andreessen Horowitz portfolio companies. It's Armand from Pave. Have you heard our name tossed around? I sound like a telemarketer. It's the little uptones. It's the little perfections. You want to sound like you're casually calling a buddy and you're verifying, hey, you, you've heard of us before. Matthew, I want to go back to this point on gatekeepers. And the reason is, in old man fashion, I would like to pose an opposing argument. So you're essentially revealing the fact that you're helping someone or you're trying to sell something. I'm curious, why is it that versus just asking to be put through in the first place? Yeah, good question. This would probably be used more in a situation where you don't know who you're being put through to. So if you know who to be put through to, for sure, let's just get put through and and pass through the gatekeeper. But here I would use this in a situation where you don't know, you're not sure. Probably more seen like previously I worked in with small businesses, selling to small businesses. You probably see this, like Nick mentioned the law firms, right? Like they're like a family office type situation where potentially you can't find all of the detail that you want on the sales tools available for who are decision makers. And so that's where I would probably use this uh, more commonly. But again, like I said, I think when you act confused, it's disarming. I like making hundreds of thousands of phone calls. I, if I'm acting like, like you said, Armand, to your point, if I just say it straight like that, I'm going to come across as, as a salesperson and get hung up on. But if I come across as somebody who is uh, less, less in your face, 
hopefully is the goal, then the idea is that I'll have more of a conversation with this person. They'll start to open up. We can, I can learn a few more things. To Nick's point, and what we would do when I was selling to restaurants is we'd get on, oftentimes we'd get, because we're calling into the stores, we would get on with uh, someone at the front counter. It could be a manager, but more likely than not, it's somebody who's just working the store. And so when you're confused to them, they're kind of like, yeah, sure. What do you want? Okay. This, yeah, this is the person. They'll give you some more information that we can then go and call back or potentially they'll just put them right on right there. I've had a number of calls that I've done to restaurants where I would act confused and, and go through this. And then the guy'd be like, yeah, why don't you just talk to John? He's right here. And then they'd put him on the phone and John and I would could start talking. Yeah. So the big takeaway that I have from this is if you are a rep who is spending an hour or like 45 minutes trying to find a piece of information about who the right contact is or a piece of information about the account, sometimes it can be a lot faster to just call with the intent of getting information because a cold call with the intent just to get information might take you like three, four minutes as opposed to spending an extended amount of time poking around in a bunch of different data sources or scrolling the internet or looking at every page on a company's sitemap. So let's actually flash forward to when this person, John, answers the phone. It's the owner of the restaurant that you're calling, let's say. And they get on and they say, hey, Matthew, you, you called. It sounds like you were looking for someone who oversees this stuff. Like, how can I help you? What's your approach now that you have the prospect on the phone as opposed to the gatekeeper? Honestly, I've tried so many different approaches here of just asking them questions. So like previously with restaurants, I sold point of sale systems to restaurants. So I would just say, hey, curious, what system are you using? How do you like it? Just get into questions with them and having a conversation. And that was really good at the time. Now I'm selling to much larger companies and that's, that same approach doesn't really work. So I've actually employed the problem prop. So I'm starting to, <laughs> I'm starting to use that guys. It's, it's been awesome. So I would say now, typically when we're working with sales reps, what we see is they love to do reminders and follow-ups on sticky notes and on to-do lists and maybe sometimes on, on their pipeline on CRM. But one problem with that is that those often get missed and then they get lost. Have you experienced that before? And I actually literally used this yesterday with a VP of a large company and it was excellent. I've leaned into the problem prop and then go down. So at Boomerang, this is what we do, et cetera, just like you guys shared. And I love that one right now. So I'm leaning into that right now, candidly, Nick. The example that I oftentimes share with people, and the reason I know this was a good problem proposition, is we call it hairy lollipop specificity. There was a visual and there was an artifact involved in your problem prop. I could imagine the sticky notes and the things that are getting lost. And the hairy lollipop specificity is as follows. Imagine that you're licking a lollipop and you drop it on a shag rug and then you hold it up to the light. What do you see on that lollipop? Hair. It's got hair on it. It's disgusting. And that's the degree of specificity you want with the problem. So a lot of people lose track of things, not specific enough. A lot of people lose money, not specific enough. It takes a lot of time to do not specific enough. You need visuals, artifacts, literally break down the mind numbing tasks that they're doing on a day to day basis. I'm right there with you. And I heard you share that example, Armand. And I was like, okay, how can I be so specific about this? Like, not general at all. And so that's where we broke it down to the to do lists. So like, I might even say like scratching off the to do list so they can hear that there's probably even better approaches, but I want it to be as specific as possible when we do the problem problem. But candidly, that's that's been my new way to take it from once I get on with somebody um, here at Boomerang. Yeah. I mean, if you are thinking of building your own problem proposition, there's a couple different pieces of detail that can be helpful to weave into that problem proposition. One, and you did this in yours, is you mentioned the persona or maybe even the mm. type of company that you're talking to. So if you're calling VPs of sales at tech companies, Instead of saying, a lot of people say that it's frustrating when this happens, say, hey, when I talk to VPs of sales at tech companies, they tell me this happens. Makes it a little bit more specific. Then what you yeah. want to do is try to insert annoyance-based language. Stuff like frustrated, anxious, upset, concerned, angry. 
Another way that you can make your problem prop stronger is by inserting the scenery. And you sort of did this with like the sticky notes and stuff, but if you talk about when that problem happens, when they're following up on a deal, or when they have a prospect they talk to on the phone who says, call me in a week, and they want to make sure that they stay on top of that prospect. So you give them context for when this stuff is happening. And then the last piece of crafting a really strong problem proposition is inserting the emotion. Instead of, mm -hmm. I talked to VP of sales who they don't like, or they think it's a bit annoying, you might say they think it's ridiculous. They think it is totally absurd. And when you insert that emotion, now the other person is like, oh, Matthew gets me. This, this VP of sales that's calling me, he gets what it's like to be in my shoes. And that is how you get the prospect to open up and listen to you because you've set the stage and they're like, this person's been inside of my head before. So Nick, you mentioned knowing the use case and the user, the, the person, the persona. To me, that's been a game changer from my sales career until being an okay salesperson to being a better salesperson. And that's really honing in on who my ICP is. And for this specific one, the more detail, the better. So we have a sales ICP, a sales persona that we focus here on at Boomerang. We have so many details about who this person is what they're like, what are their attributes, what's important to them, what are their priorities? And I could go on and on, but this is the type of thing that I think all salespeople should have is an ICP persona guide for the people that they're calling so that they can pull these key things in to the problem prop. Yeah, when I was at Carta, we would oftentimes sell to finance teams, legal teams, or founders because we were helping people manage their equity. And if you went to a legal person, with a bunch of finance problems, like they had to file expense accounting, it just totally wouldn't land. Another way you can cut it is you can cut it in above the line, below the line. So when I was at PAVE, we sold everything to HR. But if you're using below the line, number of spreadsheets, number of clicks language with a chief people officer, it's totally not gonna land. So Matthew, let's assume that your problem prop lands, you handle some objections, things go well, and then you ask for the meeting. You're giving them two options. You say, how's today or tomorrow? They look at you, they say, hey, I really appreciate this call. It's interesting, but I have to go and I don't have my calendar in front of me. Would you mind sending me some times over email? How do you handle that? Yeah, honestly, that's a, a really tricky one, Armand. I don't think that there's like a silver bullet here for me. I, I, at least I haven't discovered a silver bullet, I should say, on this one. Now, I would say this is my first thing that I would say here, and then I will uh, back this up with the second point. First thing in this situation is I would say, hey, totally makes sense. I get it. Um, you're out and about. Let me put a time on the calendar that's tentative for us that we can aim for. And if that doesn't work out, if that's not good, if something comes up during that time, we can adjust that. It's not a problem. So how does this time or this time work for you for us to meet next? Always got to leave the meetings with a dart on the calendar. If people don't have their calendar in front of them, that's nonsense. They are talking to a device that has their calendar on it. They're just too busy. And if you go and ask them over email again, you're essentially opening the door for them to say no to the meeting again. Instead, I don't even ask. I'll be like, totally fine. I know you got a dash. I'm going to send you a hold for late on Thursday so it's out of the way so I don't accidentally battleship one of your other meetings. Would you mind accepting it or picking one of the backup times in the invite? And so if they want to switch the invite, it's not a matter of, do you pick one of the ones in my email? It's literally, there are other backup times inside of the invite. Just grab another one right there. The other thing that I might do is if, is if they're like, no way, not a chance in hell I'm going to do this. I'll send them an email now with Boomerang. And you guys would be maybe surprised for this because I'm surprised by it. But actually, we're getting more meetings that way than we ever have on any other calendaring tool. And so I send it. It's an in-email calendar invite and people just go in and they book. And I wouldn't say that's again, another silver bullet. I think that's your last kind of uh, catch all. If they're totally not going to do it, we do send those now. So, but I would prefer to put it on the calendar and I agree with you, Armand. So one thing that I know can be really frustrating with cold calling is you do all of this work, you dial a bunch of numbers, you act like a confused old man for hours a week cold calling, and maybe even a couple hours later when you're at the mall looking for the restroom and you can't find it, you get a meeting on the calendar, 
and then the prospect doesn't show up. Is there anything that you're doing in between when the cold call gets put on the calendar and when the meeting happens to improve your show rates? We reach out before the meeting, 24 hours before the meeting, we reach out to confirm the meeting. I don't know what our ratios are right now because this is still a new motion here at Boomerang, but we prefer that they reschedule than just no show. I think everybody would agree with that. So it, it, for us, We'll take the reschedule to a couple of days later rather than a no show and, and a ghost. So we do that 24 hours uh, before the meeting, send an email out. Sometimes we'll make another call or I'll have an uh, SDR on my team make another call and we'll say, hey, we still good for tomorrow at this time, especially if it was more than three, four days out. We'll do another call just to connect in between. But if there's not, if it's like a next day thing, we'll just shoot an email over and typically people respond, yeah, I'm good. I'm excited. Looking forward to our next meeting. And then we move on. But I think that you've got to have a confirmation, some type of confirmation, especially as the time window goes. If you're pl seven plus days out, it's going to be really tough to keep that meeting, even like for us to remember that meeting, let alone keep it for somebody on the other side. Completely agree. The rule of thumb is oftentimes if it's within the first seven days, you need to send one confirmation the day before. But if it's three weeks out, send a deposit or something a week before to create some goodwill, send them some information, send them something that you noticed on their site, do something to make them feel guilty about potentially no showing that meeting a week later, and then confirm it the day before. But Matthew, inevitably, some people are still going to go and no show the meeting. So when someone no shows the meeting, what is your no show slash ghosting get back process? Good question. Good question. I, and I'm just pointing to that we would do that at my last company. We did, if you were two weeks out, we would have probably three or four touch points in between that just to make sure. So I'm right in line with what you're saying. And I like the creative. It's like not a call, not an email. What else could I do to get on their radar? Ping them on LinkedIn, look at their profile, something like that. I think that's all, all good things. Or if I find an article that's like interesting, I might text them that article before our meeting. But yeah, in terms of getting ghosted, no show, all that type of stuff happens to the best of us. It sucks. It's annoying, I, it, it, but it happens. And so what we do is if they no show, we have one of our team members will reach out about three plus four times and then try to get that meeting rescheduled. Previously, we didn't have a tool like Boomerang at my other company. And so it was hit or miss. Honestly, we'd call back, try to get the owner. Sometimes we'd get them, sometimes we wouldn't. But at Boomerang, we're finding a lot more reschedules because we're sending out that in Gmail calendar again, and it's it's working. We're, they're booking on there, it's easy for them, less than three clicks, they just click away and, and get another meeting on the calendar. So we call, we email, we do all the things and try to get that meeting back. But, but yeah, there you go. It's funny, you mentioned you used to sell to restaurants and now when I make a reservation at a restaurant, they must have learned from you because the same thing happens to me. I made a reservation <laughs> for a steak dinner with my fiance and I got four texts, I got a courtesy phone call two days before to make sure that we were on. But this stuff works. And the reason for it is prospects respond in kind. And they follow what's called the rule of reciprocity. And if we show that we are making a thoughtful effort in advance of the meeting by doing things like calling them to confirm, hey, is there anything in particular you really want to make sure that we cover? I'm doing some prep for our meeting now, and I want to make sure we get to your key points. When we send an agenda before the meeting of, hey, here's how I think we should spend our time, even if they want to make some changes and amend that agenda, what we're showing is, hey, I'm putting some effort into this thing. And prospects will see that, and you are more likely to get communication from them in advance of the meeting that does one of two things. One, they're like, yeah, we're still on, and here's some things that I'm thinking of to make sure that this is a productive meeting. Great, you've already done some pre-discovery discovery. You will have a better meeting now. Two, they'll tell you, oh my gosh, thanks for sending this. Hey, I need to move this. But now you don't look like a buffoon and burn 20 minutes of your day preparing for a meeting, getting on, sitting there with your smile for seven minutes, realizing they're going to no-show you, sending them a bunch of messages to pepper them to try to reschedule. And so the little dose of effort in advance of your meeting pays tremendous dividends and has an outsized impact for the amount of work that you actually have to do. Talk to me about your on that call, Matthew five minutes go by. You're still sitting there. You're waiting for the prospect. What do you do? Yeah, great question. Had this happen today. 
just for what it's worth. <laughs> so I got ghosted today. So what I did, I'll just walk you through exactly what I did. I, I got on, I, I called the person, I actually called the office. And I asked them to patch me through to the person. They said, we don't have that, but her number is this. And I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give her a call. And so I called her, went to voicemail, realized that she's probably not going to be there. Now, I was preparing for this meeting. I was a little distracted. Normally, I would have sent her a text as well and just said, hey, are we still on for today? If it's her cell number, I don't know if this was, but I failed at my own to-dos today. So we're all human, right? But I would have sent her a text and then I sent her an email and I just said, hey, looks like something came up for you today. That makes sense. Would love to get another time on the calendar. Here's my calendar with my Boomerang and Gmail calendar. Send that over to get it going. And that's candidly what I did. Pick that apart, you guys. I don't know. What would you do? What would you do better? <laughs> no, I would say that as Hannah Montana says, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. And perfect is sometimes the enemy of good. And so you executed, you followed up, you did what you could. And speaking of everybody makes mistakes, we've gone over on this calendar invite. And so we got to wrap and move to the final question, Matthew. And the final question is this. We've talked about a lot of really great things salespeople should be doing. Now I got to ask you about a shouldn't. And so my final question is, what is one bad habit that you see a lot of salespeople exhibiting that you think they need to break because it hurts them more than it helps? I think the number one differentiator between a good salesperson and a great salesperson is how well they keep their CRM, how up to date. The, the, the measure of up to dateness of the CRM is probably the same measure of success of that salesperson. So I think if anyone's looking to break a habit, it's get in your CRM and update it every day. Your sales manager will love you. The company will love you. And your prospects will move and progress further along because you're doing that. Amazing. I have a homework assignment for after this episode. Matthew, thank you for joining us. Everybody <laughs> stick around for a 60-second recap coming up soon. All righty, Nick. It is time for a two-by-two two recap email with our good friend, Matthew Mazinkowski. What do you have for your two? Number one is do not spend excessive amount of time poking around on the internet looking for prospect information when sometimes you could just call the account and get information. I shared the example in this episode of how I would do that if I were calling to find out the executive committee of a law firm. So sometimes the phone is your fastest form of research, believe it or not. Number two was you want to be like the restaurant that is calling you when you make a reservation. Show that you are putting intentional effort into prepping for a meeting when you confirm that meeting, and your prospect will more often respond in kind by showing up, by being prepared, and by, if they need to move the meeting, letting you know in advance. Number three, there are four things that Nick mentioned in Soblin Prop that you can use to get to Harry Lollipop specificity. You can describe the persona who felt the problem, the annoyances they felt like the post-it notes, the scenery, aka where were they when it happened, and then the emotion that they felt. Were they frustrated, mind blown, etc. And then lastly, number four, if you are confirming a meeting that's within one week, do it the day before. If you're confirming a meeting that's more than one week out, do a one week prior confirmation and a one day before confirmation. All righty, Nick, how could people help us out? In this episode, we talked about the heard the name tossed around opener. And if you've been listening to 30 MPC for a while, you've probably heard us reference Armand's favorite cold call opener that he would use to book one in four meetings when a prospect answered the phone. And if you want to read the full breakdown of how you can craft your own heard the name tossed around opener, literally ripped from the 30 MPC book on cold calling. Armand, I guess you were lazy this week and you literally just copy pasted from the book and you're giving away an entire section for free, which causes me some level of angst, but I'll give you a pass today. Folks, in the show notes, you can go get that for free. So if you want to create one of the best cold call openers in the world for yourself for free from the 30 MPC book on cold calling, check out the show notes and we'll see you next week on the show. 